And so they, how do we plan to do certain things at a certain time, but it all meant a great deal of hard work. And so the father of the family and um, his oldest son at that stage, uh, they really got stuck in. And indeed, particularly, they worked very hard in the garden. And of course, first impressions always impress. And as far as the garden is concerned, it was nothing but work and work and work and work. Until they got to the point where really there was a complete transformation uh, in what anybody would have seen, what it used to be over against what it became. And then there were some visitors came one day and they looked out and round the place and they had all sorts of uh, very complimentary things to say about the garden and the flowers and, and anything else. And then one of the visitors turned to the young son who had been working with his father in the garden. And they said to the young son, isn't it wonderful what God can do in a garden? And the wee fella, as quick as a shot, he says, well, you want to see it when he had it himself? <laughs> Now, I simply mention that because there is lessons that we can learn from that particular story. Because anything that has to be achieved always involves hard work. And even as part of the church, and I want to say to the young people that you are part of the church, and indeed there is a place for you where God would want you to play your part. And it will require work. And at the same time, as whatever the job happens to be, whether it is trying to befriend someone who is perhaps lonely, and I'm talking about young people who are lonely even in this day and age, whether it is that, or whether it is helping even in small chores about the church, God would want to take that and bless it not only to you as an individual, but to bless other people through your work. And I feel that with such opportunities, it will be great on at one stage when God will be able not only to use you, but because of a place that is prepared for you in heaven, will be able to thank you for all that has been done. And now I understand that we're going to have the praise group singing for us at this stage, and it has been recorded, as we understand it all, and it will be projected.
and indeed we're grateful to those who prepared that praise for us for the times <coughs> celebration today. Returning this morning to Matthew chapter 13, and we are reading verses 1 through to verse 23. <coughs> Matthew 13, reading through to verse 23. So let us hear the word of God. <coughs> the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it. Some fell in rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell amongst thorns which grew up and choked the plants. And still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. <coughs> this is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they will quickly fall away. The seed falling amongst the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, make it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. And this is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And we know indeed that God will bless his word to each heart to his glory. Jesus, in his preaching and his teaching ministry, was very skilled indeed in conveying truth through the painting of word pictures. Pictures which were clear and easily understood. And so as the, the crowd gathered to hear Jesus preach on this occasion from a boat, he told this parable of a farmer going out to sow. And remember it was in order that people would understand the truth about the kingdom. And in this parable he underlines a number of important points. And I simply want to use two headings to try and summarize what Jesus is saying to us. And the first is simply the encouragement that there is in working for the King of Kings and indeed for his kingdom. The encouragement. And then we want to look at the different responses on the part of those who were listening. 
with regard to the truth that Jesus shared. I must say, reading this, I couldn't help but wonder if the disciples were somewhat disheartened and dispirited because of the response, the limited response to the message that Christ proclaimed about his Father's kingdom. A message which was certain to transform people, give them a vision of meaning and purpose in relation to life. And indeed the very joy which results from kingdom living. And the crowds listening to Jesus, those crowds were growing, had an appetite to listen to what he was saying. But the unfortunate thing was there was no response to that message. No response. And that is the real question. Jesus knew human nature. He knew it better than the people themselves. And Jesus didn't intend to force a response. In fact, it has been said often enough that there is one thing that he won't do. And that is pressurize people against their will to enter the kingdom. The response has to be voluntary. It has to be based on love. And it has to be, above all, based on a keen sense of me. Because of our sinfulness. And indeed because of the grace which God is offering and will continue to offer. And it will remain that way until we are all called home. But the fact remains that there will always be people while they live who will not respond. And he gives us some of the reasons why that should be so. And I just want to say this morning that if we move from that particular period that we are talking about to now, I would say that this is what makes our efforts in mission and evangelism difficult. Sometimes discouraging, sometimes even depressing. Plenty of effort invested, but no significant response. But here is our encouragement this morning. Verse 8 tells us, Other seed fell on good soil and brought forth thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And that's what gives us reason for confidence. That's what gives us reason for our certain hope. Jesus making a promise, you do the sowing and I will look after the growth. You do the sowing and I will look after the growth. I'm sure you bring to mind the words that Paul said to the Corinthians. He says, take heart your labor is never in vain in the Lord. Never in vain. And our response to those occasions when we're tempted to ask the question, perhaps from discouragement and all right, what's the use? What's the use? The response surely must be that any words spoken for Christ any love shown and expressed for his sake, any practical witness offered, will always find in some people a welcome, and it will turn out to be a productive impact for the kingdom. The gospel seems to be a very small seed falling on the resisting secular world. 
And we may feel that we have every right to wonder what chance it has. May feel all sorts of things in relation to rapper. But what Jesus says about this seed that we sow, it has and it holds the secret of powerful life and it will not fail. It will not fail. So are my soul and simply leave the results to Almighty God. And we do that because we know that that seed is the only bread for the soul. Or we mock our labour and even scoff at the task for which we are responsible. But one thing is absolutely sure according to Jesus. There will be a harvest for that labour. And so Jesus' word to us this morning is that we mustn't think that we have failed if our message is refused. Not all the seed falls on deaf ears or hard hearts. There is seed which falls into good ground and there will be a harvest. I read a story about a sports coach at a school where he taught. He had a foul temper matched by a foul mouth. And one of his students decided that she would go and speak to him about his language. And she did. And she told him that when he used the Lord's name in a vulgar and a disrespectful way, it hurt and it offended her because she was a Christian. And that sports coach started yelling at that young girl. And she was quite upset and walked away. But after that encounter, that teacher watched that girl in class. And at the end of the year, after her final exams, the teacher asked if he could have a word with her before going home. <coughs> and he recalled the day when she spoke to him about his language. He said, you are a Christian. Isn't everyone in this country a Christian? The girl told in a simple way what he needed to do to become a Christian. Simply to confess his sins to Almighty God and ask him for forgiveness. And he will find it. And eventually that teacher went into Christian ministry. Served 20 odd years with young life, that mission amongst young people. All because a young girl who sold seed and ground considered hard, stony, full of weeds, but it brought a heartwarming result. And this is what Jesus is telling us. All seed doesn't fall on deaf ears or hard hearts. And that's our encouragement. I want to just look at some of the responses that we find in this passage. I simply want to say and make clear that there's nothing defective or deficient in relation to the seed. It always has something to do with the soil into which the seed falls. And it's important to note Jesus' comment about hearing. 
In short, Jesus doesn't want the truth of the kingdom to go in one ear and about the other. It's too serious for that. He doesn't want the reality of the gospel to roll off us like water of a duck's back. And so he says, listen with hearing ears. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear, Jesus says. And I would want to say that we will not be judged because of our knowledge or lack of it. We will be judged by how we listen to the Word of God and how we received it. Did we take active steps to be obedient to the truth which the Word revealed? And each of us, each of us can only answer for ourselves. And that is a serious responsibility. And here's what Jesus says in relation to the various responses. See in the path that we get into the ground at all. Ground that the trampled hard like stone because of continual and constant traffic. I want to say, friends, this morning, busyness, busyness can be a dangerous diversion. Making room for everything except for the feeding on the bread of life. Seed didn't have a chance to make an impact. The seed couldn't find the right conditions which would have made all the difference when it came to meaning and purpose for living. Under the pressures of society, we would want to persuade us that there are no absolutes in life, that there is no need for God. Because of our scientific abilities and technological know-how, so many, many things which keep the seed of the Word of God on the surface and can't get right down to where it matters. And then it disappears. Jesus goes on to tell us about the seed which falls into the rocky ground. It can rarely produce and sustain any maturing process. And that's why Jesus says when the heat comes, the sun scorches the plant and it dies. He's speaking here about those who come to personal faith with great expectations, believing that Christian discipleship is sweet and easy. And then they're confronted with trials and suffering and heartache and problems, just like everyone else in our fallen world. And indeed because they believed that Christian discipleship was the soft option, they discovered that it is anything but that. And they fall away. They shun the church. And indeed the faith that they once professed. And indeed held dear. And because of that absence from the church fellowship, the living word doesn't have the opportunity to nourish and sustain them. And I want to suggest this morning that our response to pressure and pain and problems will always tell us something about the reality of our commitment and indeed the need for Christian fellowship and nurture. The necessity of What about the seed that fell among the thorns? The word used to describe this reality 
is strangled. It gives a picture of a life which can't grow, can't develop, because it is being cut off from the very sustaining source of life. And because of that, it loses its focus regarding what discipleship demands. You will remember me saying at the beginning about Jesus assuring us that there's a certain harvest when we sow seeds. And I want to say that the assumption can be made that disciples, those who are committed to, to the Saviour, they are his agents in the kingdom building. But Jesus is telling us that the life of the kingdom sickens. It sickens with the preoccupations and the priorities change. In verse 22, he says, The man who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of life, those temporal material concerns, and he says, The deceitfulness of wealth. Choke it, choke it, making it unfruitful. Terry Johnson in his book about the parables comments, this parable is designed to provide unprovoked questions on self-examination. He says spiritual life is being choked out of us. We need to pull out the weeds and get rid of any and everything that distracts us from the fruitful deception of God's Word. And that is why we need to redirect our thoughts to do what Jesus is asking in the latest kingdom. We know that Almighty God will help us and indeed we can expect a great harvest. And now Thomas is going to lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. Father, as we have again heard your word, our minds and our hearts go to the many places where we see the seed has fallen. And we are mindful that we are not called to be selective in our sowing, just to be faithful. And so we pray this morning that each of those places where your seed has been sown, that there will be a harvest. That the thorny ground will be, become fertile. That the hard ground will become broken. Stony ground will become yielding. As we come before you now, we are mindful of this season in which we are sowing. It is a difficult season, and it's so easy to become discouraged. Father, help us to hear your word of encouragement in the work of the kingdom and your promise that for faithful sowing there 
there will be a harvest. We come before you now, we bring before you the cares and the anxieties that are choking up our hearts. We bring before you those who have been given responsibility to lead us safely through political leadership and community leadership, leadership in our schools and leadership in our businesses, leadership in the commercial areas of life. Father, in this season, We know that just as we have given thanks for the harvest of the field and the farm, that your work in the spiritual harvest is still ongoing. And so we pray for those who are leading our community, that through that leadership, your harvest might be wrong. We come in this service of harvest celebration. We bring our prayer in the name of Jesus. And the prayers that we have prayed and the questions that we have asked for those in our community, we ask of ourselves. that you might be able to continue to do your work in us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Our thanks to all who have helped prepare this service uh, to the praise group, especially to Joy. Thank you, Joy, for, for leading this morning. And especially to you, David, for coming uh, and sharing the, the word with us. We turn to our final item of praise. Creation sings the Father's song and we stand and sing.
Father, as we go out into the world, may we go to sow the seed of the gospel. May, wherever we go, may we prepare to share with those who are less fortunate than ourselves. May, as we go, we walk, may we walk as you would have us walk. And we know that your blessing, the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, will be with us this day and forevermore.